Uh, here's Robert Kenner speaking about Food, Inc. This project went through many evolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, it initially started when Eric Schlosser had written Fast Food Nation, and um, he was looking for someone to turn this into a documentary. Mm. Uh, simultaneously, I had read his book and uh, loved his book, and we both sort of got in touch with each other simultaneously uh, and thought it would be great to go make a documentary based on Fast Food Nation. Uh, right. A number of years transpired between the time we initially talked. I think that was like six, seven years ago. So this was prior to the, the, the feature film, the narrative it film? It was way prior. And, okay. Uh, it was even prior to Super Size Me. Oh. Uh, and what I think happened was there were people who were interested in making it, but Eric then started to make the feature film. Uh, and then we got funding at some point, but I realized that people thought they had seen Fast Food Nation, whether it was his feature that was going to be coming out, but more importantly, they thought they had seen the documentary because of Super Size Me. Mm. Uh, and I realized I needed to transform our film into something else. Mm. I, I also thought, even though Eric's book, Fast Food Nation, is not really about the fast food business. It's a much bigger topic. Oh, yeah. Uh, people thought because of Super Size Me, it had been done. Um, so we, uh, I began to think I needed to make it about how all food has been industrialized, how everything has been taken over by this machine, in effect. Yeah. And um, what... Uh, that it, and that I just wanted to show that this world has been really entirely transformed uh, without us sort of noticing what's been happening. And that's been yeah, it's been insidious, hasn't it? It's a little <clears throat> like putting you know the, the frog in the the boiling you know in the cold water and then turning the heat up. We just mm -hmm. it goes without us noticing. And at the same time, I think that's the real goal of agribusiness is to continue with this illusion that our food comes from farms with white picket fences and red barns, and uh, when in reality it's huge corporate agribusiness that's producing this food on mega, mega, uh, you know, industrial sites. Yeah. Uh, and it's all been transformed without us knowing, and it's had major consequences. So our idea shifted from... Fast Food Nation, I was influenced by Michael Pollan's book, uh, Omnivore's Dilemma, uh -huh. uh, and then I was ultimately searching for what what do we have that's new to say, and I, I think it sort of came out as we started to film. When you, when you knew that you, when you're shooting a documentary, there's so many hours of footage, <clears throat> how do you know when you're done? How do you, how do you know when you have what you need? <laughs> well... It's a good question, because on this one, it, it was very hard, because we had the construction of this film was a real challenge, because on one hand, we were trying to talk about how the food in our, the food that we're eating has been transformed in a very fundamental way that has not only changed how we eat, but it changed the land we live on, it changed the people who are producing it. it it's changed the health of the people that are eating it, so on and so forth. Uh, so how do you tell the story uh, in an emotional way, which is something I like to do, and mm -hmm. at the same time, how do you tell it without a narrator, which is also something I like to do? Uh, so it, it really presented big challenges for us, and the challenges turned out to be even greater in that I'd really hope to tell this story from multiple points of view, from right. both the industrial point of view as well as the organic, you know, super farmer point of view. Uh, but I found that basically agribusiness was not very interested in talking to me. Hmm. Uh, we spent an amazing amount of time approaching uh, corporate business to include them in this project. Uh, only to be rejected continually uh, by these companies. They just wanted to know everything we were doing. I think we were rather open in telling them. Uh, but ultimately, they did not want us, they did not want to be part of the conversation, and they did not want us to look in their kitchens. Mm. Um, so 
not being Michael Moore, I didn't want to sort of have myself on the phone being rejected, but at the same time, how do you let people know this is happening? And that became a challenge in the filmmaking. Well, forgive me if this, is, if this is an insensitive question, but do you feel that your film has suffered for their lack of participation? Well, yeah, I mean, I think on some levels it becomes a more interesting conversation when people come to the table. Right. I think that we have a food crisis in this country, uh, and I don't think it's going to be solved by going back to farming like we did in 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a sort of a romantic in thinking that we did everything perfectly before agribusiness existed. Uh, I think uh, I think that ultimately we're not going to solve these problems unless people are ready to go think about it, talk about it, and deal with it. Mm -hmm. So certainly disappointed in terms of the big picture that they weren't ready to be there. Uh, whether the film suffers or not, uh, I mean, I think it, it sort of starts to paint a more... The film became a much more frightening portrait of something that went way beyond food, which yeah. was not what I initially thought we were doing. It, became as a, it came as a big surprise to me in the course of filming that this was about a lot more than just food. Even so, you're going against... <clears throat> or maybe going against is the wrong phrase, um, but we're dealing with major corporations, uh, franchises, and, and big government. And Did you know what you were in for when you started it? I would think that that would be a, a potentially lit litigious endeavor. <laughs> I didn't realize how litigious this world was when I started. I think yeah. for me, the moment that really struck me and made me realize that this film was about more than food was when I was talking to a mother, uh, a woman named Barb Kowalczyk, who's become a food safety advocate, and she was in Washington. We followed her in Washington, speaking with congressmen uh, and people from the FDA about food safety. And then later that night, we did an interview where she talked about the death of her son. Her son died from eating a hamburger that contained E. coli. Mm. Uh, well, her son was dying, or months after her son died, she found out that her son, the E. coli that was in the hamburger that her son ate, uh, matched a recall um, of meat. Uh, but it turned out that meat was not recalled for a few weeks after her son died. Mm. So that these, they actually knew this meat was out there, but they didn't recall it. That's the power of this agribusiness. Yeah. Uh, and what I found amazing as I talked to Barb, it was a very emotional conversation, talking about the death of her son. Uh, at the end, I asked her, uh, Barb, how has this affected your eating habits? And she said that if I told you how I eat now, I would be sued. That there are people out there who are ready to sue me uh, for saying what I don't eat. Yeah. And I got goosebumps. I thought, you you know, how could that be? How could that be in this country that you could be sued for saying that? And she said, well, look at Oprah. You know, exactly. someone was on Oprah's show and they said they didn't want to eat a burger, and uh, or they there someone had gotten sick from eating a burger, uh, and it's, Oprah said it makes you think twice about that. And uh, she was sued and spent six years in the courts and spent over a million dollars on her defense. And there are powerful laws that protect the food industry, 